Dennis Sarfate making his first appearance. What will you do to defend the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Welcome to the Green Dragon Tavern, where we talk a little treason. I'm Zach Lautenschlager. And I'm Dennis Sarfate. This week, a three-week battle comes to a close as the U.S. House elects Louisiana Representative Mike Johnson as Speaker of the House. Bit of a dark horse candidate, really. Turns out that uh, the rank-and-file Republicans, the rhinos as we call them in Congress, could support him, and the conservatives couldn't uh, muster enough to oppose. He certainly does talk a good game, and there's some great things being said from the front of the House that we'll talk about in a minute. We also have to acknowledge that uh, a little personal experience with Mike Johnson played a role in personally killing uh, the bill to end abortion in Louisiana, and that's just a reality that's out there. Um, you can't can't deny it. He was he was there, and as a Louisiana congressman, has influence, and a former member of the Louisiana legislature, uh, has influence there. Yeah, you know, when it comes to you know abortion and the slaughtering of the innocent in the womb. Um, As a Christian, you have to call out what is right, what is wrong. We had that bill there in Louisiana, and um, he played a huge role. And I I can see why the rhinos enjoy him so much, because he listened to them. Uh, They didn't want this to take place. Uh, It went up a lot higher than just the uh, congressman from Louisiana. But he did as he was told. And so now he assumes the position of speaker. And, uh, you know, he said some good things, but... I like to judge a man by his character, not from what he says, just only. And I know a little bit about him now, so I'm a little hesitant to just applaud him and, and back him. But uh, it is funny to see what the uh, the leftists are saying about him. They're just so mad that he quoted scripture. Uh, <laughs> they blew a rod that he actually talked about the God of the Bible. Um, but, you know, for the leftists, we have to sit there and look at their pride flags in every public library and uh, light up the White House, so uh, I'm I'm glad that he can talk about God in a way that in fire you know fires them up. Indeed, uh, this week, Dr. James White, uh, pastor at Apologia Church and the director of Alpha and Omega Ministries, is joining us. Pastor James, thanks for joining today. We appreciate it. Well, it's uh, great to be with both of you. Uh, it's interesting all the connections that we have. Um, you know, Dennis has to endure my preaching uh, fairly regularly. Um, and yeah, I do it uh, voluntarily. So there's, <laughs> and, uh, and of course you, uh, you recently uh, debated my son-in-law. So, uh, there you go. It's, uh, uh, very, very interesting. I've been coming up to Utah all these years and making all sorts of godly trouble, uh, with your, um, with your pastor there and, uh, going to try to do some more of that in the future as well. So, We've got all sorts of neat, uh, fun connections. Yes, you know, do. mentoring Jason um, <clears throat> just the other day, I forget what podcast is on, but someone referred to Jason as the pastor of the guy who debated James White's son-in-law. <laughs> 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 and we all had a great laugh. Um, okay. but apparently, we're, we're getting famous in the shirt tail sort of way down here. <laughs> uh, so... Um, you know, when you see uh, the Speaker of the House, the newly elected Speaker of the House, say from the front, I believe that Scripture in the Bible is very clear, that God is the one that raised up each one of you, speaking to the members of the House, and God has allowed us to be brought here to this specific moment and time. It's the type of thing that in American politics is not so very unusual. It's only been very recently that uh, the people would be surprised that someone didn't say that. Um, it's important to note that that is a famous political ploy and that playing to one side or the other is the reality. Um, that's what Johnson is doing. But, of course, the left is losing their minds. Um, Congressman Jared Huffman from the 2nd District of California, who is an attorney and has represented multiple pro-abortion interests, is throwing a fit that this is theonomy. This is a theocracy, and it's wrong, and it's unconstitutional, and then he's going to turn around and applaud that uh, Joe Biden lit up the White House in a rainbow flag on during Pride Month. Uh, the hypocrisy uh, knows no bounds, apparently. And uh, so it's a great springboard to talk about uh, what we wanted to talk about anyway, which is how does the Bible apply in the civil sphere? Um, should it govern our political actions? Should it inform our laws? What is the perfect law of liberty? Um, and how do you apply it? So these are things that uh, I've pre- appreciated uh, your willingness to tackle, Pastor James. And uh, you bring, from my perspective, a very balanced 
uh, view mm -hmm. to this question. Well, isn't it interesting that uh, it was only what about was it about eighteen months ago that uh, Nadler uh, stood up there on the someone else had dared to say something about God uh, on the House floor, and he stood up and said God has nothing to do with the proceedings of this institution, and mm -hmm. and you, you, the sad thing <laughs> is you recognize that young people who are the products of the government. Um, I can't call it an educational system because it's not educating, it's indoctrinating, but uh, young people would hear him and they would think that what he was saying was sort of a given, that of course, yeah, that's that's the way it is. They don't know about history at all. They don't know. Uh, I, I, I just so clearly remember um, a number of years ago when I was at my previous church, um, my fellow elder there brought a, I don't have it here, but I, he brought this little New Testament that his father had carried uh, in World War II in Europe uh, as a foot soldier. And he opened it up and he read from the inside of the New Testament. And it was a letter from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And it was um, exhorting all of the military members uh, to read this book and that they would be blessed by it and improved by it. And, and they were printed by the government and given to the soldiers by the government. Wow. And nobody at that time really found that to be overly astonishing. Um, if you, if you read Adams, I, I think one of the most important quotes from Adams is his, is his statement that the Constitution is sufficient only for the governance of a, a religious and a moral people. It is totally insufficient for the governance of, of any other. And recognize that they saw, they didn't, they didn't view themselves establishing a theocracy, whatever, however you want to try to define that, but they did see themselves establish, establishing a, a form of government that required a fundamental um, consensus amongst the people as to what is right and wrong, good and bad. And once that consensus is lost, um, the whole basis for the, the constitution and how the constitution is supposed to work and the balances that it's supposed to have, it's lost. And we have seen a full on assault, uh, uh, upon the West and upon this nation in particular, uh, primarily through the educational system, uh, taking over the universities. I mean, you, you can't, I look at the universities today and I, and I, I still wonder why Christians honestly think that they should spend $150,000 sending their kid to a Harvard or a Yale. Um, they don't do education there. They haven't been doing it for a long, long time. Uh, but the, the, the idea still continues in the mind that it's so prestigious. Have you listened to what these people are actually teaching and believing? I'm not sure what's prestigious about it at all, but that's what they did. They captured these places. And so you see it in the legal system. You see it in our judges. Uh, they have adopted a worldview that is fundamentally in opposition to the Christian worldview. And, um, as a result, uh, we now have conversations taking place, and really they exploded after 2020. But we have conversations taking place that I'll admit I'm older than all you guys. Um, I like being the elder elder at Apologia. I'm the elderly elder, really. And um, uh, I'm older than a lot of the people I'm talking to these days. My generation, and of course I was raised a very fundamentalist Baptist mindset. Um, and I'm still recovering from a lot of that, <laughs> even, even at this time. I, but we bought into the myth of neutrality. Mm -hmm. We thought the state could be neutral in regards to the claims of Christ. We really, we built such a thick wall in between our personal piety and what took place in the society that breaking that wall um, is extremely uncomfortable for some of us older folks. 
But we have to recognize it was a it was made out of paper mache in the first place. It the myth of neutrality is one of the greatest uh, deceptions that we that we lived with. Uh, you you simply the the founders wouldn't have would have wouldn't have even uh, accepted that kind of silliness. And so I did I did get a chance to listen to your last um, uh, pro program with um, Doc Sandlin, and. You know, I sort of felt like after listening to that, well, I'm not sure where they're going to have me on, but um, <laughs> though I wear much prettier sweaters than than uh, than he does, um, <laughs> well, but than uh, any of us do, really. <laughs> well, yeah, this is true. Uh, you got to see my collection; it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, remember Imelda Marcus's shoes? No, well, there you go. There's the there's the problem. <laughs> um, but honestly, uh, he he made the same you know most of the same points that 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 I would in what he was saying in regards to. The fact that since 2020, a lot of us have all of a sudden had to wake up and realize that that neutrality doesn't exist. It's very clear that the government has no um, interest right now in maintaining such neutrality and is willing to tell Christians and the Christian church uh, what they can and cannot do, can and cannot say. The scary thing is can and cannot think. Um, and that is forcing a lot of us to re-examine our eschatologies, our cosmologies, our ecclesiologies, everything has to be put on the table because uh, unfortunately, a lot of people from my generation, we had what I would call pigeonhole theology. Um, it's sort of like those uh, in the olden days. Uh, I remember I worked at a radio station when I was in college uh, and You'd come in and and you'd have this little cubby hole that had your name on it, and anything that was supposed to be given to you it's sort of your little mailbox, and you'd just have a wall of these things, and that's what we did with theology: is you had your cubby hole for theology proper, and your cubby hole for Jesus, and your cubby hole for eschatology, and your cubby hole for uh, soteriology, and they were all separate, and you never brought them close enough together to find out if they were actually harmonious with each other. You weren't ever challenged to do that. And what's happened since 2020 is a lot of us have all of a sudden had lights turned on from different angles that we've never seen before that have forced us to go, ah, uh, wow, um, what I believe over here and what I believe over here don't really fit together very well. So I've got to figure out what to do about this. And it's made a lot of people very, very uncomfortable when I... When I came out as a uh, as a post millennialist, um, uh, of course, you know Jeff was just so proud. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I see I, that uh, that to Harbor Freight Tools, Doug Wilson wanted to claim a little credit there too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but w when I when I did that, I, I had a dear friend overseas uh, was talking to me, a pastor overseas, and he says, "Well, now I'm going to have to look into all this." <laughs> You know, it's sort of like <laughs> up till now, I was you know, everything was just it was okay. I didn't have to think about this stuff, but now I'm gonna have to think about this stuff. And uh, he came along with me too. So um, mm. uh, that that's just sort of how it's how it's been, and that has raised all the questions about how we make application of scripture in our modern context. And of course, you know, apologia has been making godly trouble for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. and has been challenging norms and putting itself out there for a long, long time. But that that wasn't, I can guarantee you, it, 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 when I was, say, 20 years old, if an apologia had existed, I would have looked at it like some freakish, what is that? What are these <laughs> people doing? Who do they think they are to be prophetically speaking to the civil magistrates? I mean, that's what are you doing? Well, you're making application in light of the enthronement of Christ after the resurrection and, and Daniel 7 uh, and uh, the fulfillment of the promise that um, uh, he's given kingdoms and nations and they'll worship him and all the rest of this stuff that we didn't, you know, with the eschatology I had as a young person, she didn't even think about making connections like that. That's just, that's over there. That's over there. Go read your Tim LaHaye book and everything is going to be okay. Um, we can't do that anymore. And so I, 
I don't claim to have all the answers as to how that's supposed to work, but I, I know one thing, what I'm trying to do, and Zach, you sort of said something about it, and I'm sort of glad at least you're seeing what I'm trying to do. Um, I live in different universes. You know, um, I'm professor of church history and apologetics at GBTS, uh, Grace Bible Theological Seminary. And so uh, Scott Annual is a fellow uh, professor there. Uh, Owen Strand, we just did. I don't know if you saw any of the um, uh, stuff we did at the G3 pre-conference where GBTS, we, right. we all spoke. And, and I was there for a, it. Some of uh, our viewers may have seen it as well. Yeah. And then there was a... <laughs> uh, dialogue at the end um right it was great and it was me against everybody else uh and i knew it was going to be that way but we obviously wanted to be able to demonstrate you can do that without um yes, getting out the long God, knives yeah. and and cutting people to shreds and, and everything else <laughs> so i get to speak in a lot of different um areas a lot of different contexts and in this day what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to um, not, not be a moderate. Uh, I'm not a moderate on almost anything. I mean, look at my sweater. That's, that's not a moderate sweater. Um, I'm, but I'm, I'm trying to recognize the dangers of people flying off the handle and becoming imbalanced at this point in time. Um, and I, I'm just trying to speak to everyone. I, I personally am really, I'm, I'm actually very, very excited by how much movement I have seen since 2020. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you may, yes. you may have had the same exact same experience I did when yes. John MacArthur preached that sermon, when they <laughs> reopened yep. against the government's commands. Yep. And of course, Dennis knows this. We never closed. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. it's just not, not because no. we were, had great insight or something like that. We just didn't think that it was the appropriate thing to do. And so, but when they reopened, and he preaches that sermon about the Lordship of Christ and the state has limited authority and stuff like that. A lot of us are sort of sitting around and going, Hey, uh, wow. Hey John, some of us have been saying this for a while. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you, you, you do know where, you do know where some of this leads, right? You know? And, and so mm -hmm. I'm excited about that personally. Mm -hmm. I I've literally seen so many people who in 2015 and where they are now in almost 2024, it's a positive move. It, it really, really mm -hmm. is. <clears throat> but I think we have to also be careful. Um, I've, I've, I've become concerned about some of the younger men who are grabbing hold of, of good, solid truths, living under the Lordship of Christ, being a man, not following the feminist insanity of our age and recognizing God made them male and female and men are given these roles and these tasks and these responsibilities. You're going to, you're going to live the best life. You know, Joel Osteen has no idea what that is, but you're going to live yeah. your best life when you're actually fulfilling the, the, the commands of God that has been given to you. That's great, but there's a tendency to, to lose balance and go off into weird stuff. And so I don't know about you, but uh, you know I'm I'm sick and tired of seeing uh, the memes on on Twitter of uh, bulked up Charles Spurgeon looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger or or Athanasius <laughs> lifting uh, weights. You know I, I'm sorry, uh, I know a lot about Athanasius, and uh, he was he was very much enamored with the Desert Fathers. There was a lot of asceticism in Athanasius, so. He would never have taken in enough calories to bulk up for anything. I can assure <laughs> you that. Right. <laughs> uh, but, but, and and I'm trying. You know, I'm not trying to discourage people. I mean, it, it's really funny. I made a comment last week, and the the internet blew up, and people are going, "You're telling men they shouldn't get fit and all the rest of this stuff." And I'm sitting here going, "Guys, <laughs> I've ridden a bicycle 162 thousand miles." Since how many times is that around? How many times is that around the Earth? I'm ge getting ready to hit seven, seven yeah. times around the Earth at the equator. Okay, um, so you also do more crunches than a lot of these guys have ever done in their entire life. Well, that's true I found too. That out. I found that out. 
but it doesn't do me any good. That's the problem. I, I keep doing it because I, I can only imagine how bad it would be if I, if I didn't. But the point is, I, I've been doing that type of stuff. I've got nothing against being super fit and, and pushing yourself and all the rest of that stuff. But it can become an idol. I mean, it can become a situation where that's, what, that's where your mind is all the time. You're sitting there in the service. And what are you thinking about? The workout you're going to be getting on Monday. And when I just made those slight comments, oh, man, alive, people canceling me right and left. And, oh, you're so discouraging. All this stuff. So I, I recognize that when we're going into new areas and we're pulling off bad stuff in the past, the myth of neutrality, stuff like that, the, the problem is you can get a pendulum swing. You know, uh, so we were over here and here's where we should be. And, whoa, we're going to keep on going. And I'm, I'm trying to um, speak in such a way as to encourage balanced biblical reaction to what's going on, uh, knowing that all of us could end up sitting next to each other in the gulag in a very short period of time. If the Lord wills, that's going to happen. Uh, uh, Dennis knows I've I actually preached a sermon last year, I think or the year before, uh, five things to... Make sure you understand if you ever find yourself in solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. uh, because I've read The Hiding Place. Mm -hmm. uh, ever been to The Hiding Place in the uh, in Netherlands? Um, I have not, but I have read all of them. Yes. I and I've, 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 has a I've, I've, I haven't read. Yeah, I've, I've gone through the little door into The Hiding Place. Yeah. And it, it's, yep. it's amazing. And uh, you think about what they went through. And we're going to find out, I, I think, and I, I'm saying this to myself, how quickly we are willing to complain to God when we lose all of our creature comforts. Mm -hmm. And um, there are certain ways that the enemy attacks, and there are certain beliefs that we have to be have absolutely firm commitment on. And uh, so, like, like I said, when you're preaching sermons like that, uh, we need to be balanced. We need to be balanced in, in, in all of our lives. And uh, that's something I've been trying to do. And you guys haven't had to almost say a word uh, the entirety yeah, of the story great. so far. You sort of knew that that was coming, though. Uh, yeah, if you I'm used to it. it. I'm used to it. But, you know, I've, I've re the last couple of days, I've listened to a couple of things that you've done with Pastor Doug Wilson um, on the subject of Christian nationalism. And I really appreciated it. The viewpoint that you said if we just force everyone to get baptized, then we're just a bunch of baptized pagans. Uh, and, and you feared the, the, the sacralism. And then you actually talked about Fritz Erba. Um, that man was in the ground. And then when you explained the situation that he was in, um, it blew me away because I sat here and I see the memes on Twitter. Twitter is, is literally becoming a detestable place that I just really have a hard time staying on now with reform folks that are supposed to be Christians that don't act like Christians. But he sat there and was getting preached to by the Presbyterians on infant baptism. Lutherans, Lutherans, Lutherans. Lu sorry, Lu sorry, Lutheran. not Presbyterian, Lutherans, Lutherans. And, and before um, you shack up too closely, he wasn't at a Baptist. So there's also yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, but he didn't change his mind. He, he right. sat there for six years until his death, correct? Yes, and so are, are, are we that strong? Are these, these men on these keyboards on Twitter, are they that strong to hold the position to be in a spot like he was in, um, in the chamber in between, you know, what was it? 30 feet down, I thought you said, or 40 feet down. Yeah, 30 no or 40 windows. feet down in the, in the tower there at the, at the Vartburg Castle. And what made it so amazing to me, and there's a, by the way, there's a five, less than five minute long video on YouTube. If you put James White, Fritz Erba, E-R-B-E, it'll come up. We recorded it when I was there right before the 500th anniversary of the Reformation in 2017. What, what blew me away was I stood on the top of that tower and I looked across the courtyard at the very room where Luther translated the New Testament into German. And that's what everybody thinks about is he's, he's Junker Jorg. He's hiding out from, the, from the, uh, the state, all the rest of this kind of stuff. And he translates the New Testament in German. It's so vital for the German language. All these things. And the Lutherans were really good at getting the Bible out to people. They wanted people to read scripture, so on and so forth. But here's Fritz Erba. He reads the scripture. He becomes convinced 
on this issue. And he ends up imprisoned within 100 meters of where the New Testament that he read and became convinced of was translated. And he loses his freedom because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's one of the issues that um, I, I, my, the folks that, that went on that journey with us, I'm so glad we got an opportunity to do it. They were a little troubled by how honest I was about the reformers and the Reformation. Because the first night in Berlin, I told everybody, I said, look, I recognize the number of the men that we're going to be talking about would never have extended to me the right hand of fellowship. In fact, they might have executed me. And you know what the sad thing is, guys? The folks that put on the tour, which they have taken lots of Christians over there, and we're talking people that if I started naming names, you'd go, oh, yeah, okay. They drew me aside after the people had left, and they said, you need to understand something. We've listened to church historians and, and big names. No one has ever said what you said tonight. And I'm like, about what? About the fact that they would not extend the right hand of fellowship. There was the issue of, um, you know, kicking people out or executing people or giving them their third baptism as, as in Zurich. Um, they never, they never talk about that. And I'm like, well, that gives you a caricature. That doesn't give you an accurate understanding. It gives you a cartoon version of the Reformation. And that also sets people up to be um, right. disappointed when they find out what the real history actually was. I can't do that. I, I teach church mm -hmm. history. I, I gotta, you've got to be honest about all this stuff. And you've got to be honest about what happened at Munster. Oh, goodness. <laughs> if you want to see the absolute worst of Anabaptism, there, there's Munster. Uh, that, was, that was there. Uh, I've told that story on, uh, on the, the Sheologians webcast that my daughter has, uh, two, two episodes, because it takes that long to tell the wildest, craziest story. If you've not, if you've not listened to the story of Munster, I'm telling, I'm telling, have you guys seen that? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, no. I'm familiar with it. Okay, you're, you're, but I, did you hear my rendition of it? Because I, 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 I'm going to look it up now. <laughs> you need to look up it, Sheologians, my, my, my daughter's webcast. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. I had just come back from Munster. So that made it even more, you know, useful that I had just been there. Um, right. But it is the craziest story in all of church history. I know a fair amount about church history. I cannot think of anything. Wow. And to be mm -hmm. honest with you, I don't know why they've made a German movie, but I don't know why there is not a movie about this. Because you would not have to add anything. You would not have to fake anything. You would not have to bring a love story in or anything else. Just tell the story. It would be a blockbuster because it Lord, is about Lord TV. Let's oh, get yeah. lore on that. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> that's what needs to be done because it was insane. But the point being... Um, all of, you know, and, and we sort of went away from the things there, but the reality is if we don't know what actually happened in the Reformation, if we don't That's right. recognize that the reformers were coming out of a sacral system, but they didn't immediately abandon it, right. um, then we're reinventing the wheel as we start thinking about the relationship of church and state and everything else. They're coming out of a thousand well, more like 1,200 years of a situation where uh, the sovereignty of the church and the sovereignty of the state were badly intermingled, and it went different directions as to who had you know, the, the control at any one given time. And if we don't recognize that, then we, we're having to start from ground zero. We're, at, we're have to start reinventing the wheel to even be thinking about this stuff. So I think church history is really important in that, in that area. And unfortunately, large number of um, our modern uh, evangelical brothers and sisters just don't even care about what came yeah. before us at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the things I've really appreciated about Jason Wallace up there in, in Utah. Uh, his recent video on uh, Eastern Orthodoxy has just made him so popular. Uh, amongst <laughs> Eastern Orthodox, but it was really, really well done. It was, it was, it was great, and, and and that's the kind of stuff that that we need to have, uh, so that we realize that as we're talking about stuff today, this is not the first time Christians have discussed that's right. these things. Mm -hmm. Oh man, 
And I, that's the reoccurring theme on, of this show, <laughs> unwillingly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and that that doesn't mean that we have to go. And they've always gotten it right in the past because the fact of the oh, matter exactly. is there's all sorts of contradictory conclusions that have been come to in the past. But if you don't know what those arguments were, you're starting from ground zero. You're, and you're, if you don't you're know having what to start all over again. Right, exactly. We can we can sit around and theorize and argue over how many philosophers should American politics have and how many theologians should American politics have. And just it's inanity because those questions have been answered and not just by other people who had opinions. We have 2,000 years of people putting those opinions into practice, and you you have a very clear and traceable result. And this is this is something that when we when we either willingly or unwittingly whitewash history, and it's not just the church that has done that, American history has been whitewashed mm-hmm. in many cases. The Lossings, um, as a, the fascinating family of... Uh, of historians that blew the doors wide open for the Beards, who were the Marxists, the first Marxists who made, uh, made American uh, history textbooks. Um, hmm. It's really easy, really easy to take down good history if you just take out some of the bad stuff and whitewash it, smooth it out a little bit. George Washington was a, you know, was a saint, and, and, and uh, Abraham Lincoln was a saint, and Benjamin Franklin was a saint, and Martin Luther didn't do anything wrong, and, and whatever it may be. Um, what is Marx, the Marxist, the primary Marxist tenet is that all of these people are bad people because they did something bad. You can take any human and you can pick them apart and say, well, I don't like this person because they did bad things. And then the Marxists turn around and whitewash their own people and lie about it. And that is, that is the tactic. We hand it to them on a silver platter when we fail to address the failures of our people. Right. When we fail to acknowledge and say, well, yes, this was tried. And that's an important reality to recognize and to judge people, and this is something that you do very well, Dr. White, um, as a bona fide historian. I am not a historian. I am a history buff who works in in politics. Um, But anyone who observes history has to recognize um, that you have to start with the reality, and you have to break it down and recognize that these people need to be judged with partially within their own time. Right. That is a long-standing historical reality. And when the Marxists say, no, we're not going to do that, they're lying. They're, at, they're, they're going way beyond that with their own people. They mm. want two standards. We need one standard. It needs to be honest. It needs to be an immutable standard of morality. And then we need to recognize that there's a, a little grace is due sometimes, depending on what was going on, without whitewashing it, without saying, well, it's okay for Luther to have behaved that way. It's okay for Washington to have executed the uh, the missions against the Whiskey Rebellion, for example. It's okay for um, Jefferson to have cut Christ out of the Bible, um, at least earlier in his life. No, that's not okay. Um, but you need to look at it and say, where were they coming from? Why did they do that? How can we learn from those experiences mm-hmm. as to why they were wrong? Um, th- this, this, is where, this is where we are with American political philosophy. If the answer to um, the, and, and I, I will acknowledge, I think it's worth repeating, I believe that the modern quote-unquote secular state, the humanist Marxist state, is a direct... Uh, result of American pietism, that we set the stage, set the table, and opened the door and invited them in by imagining that Christians don't need to speak to politics, that we can compartmentalize, as you mm-hmm. have described earlier. Um, I'm not saying we invented it. it. It existed long before that. It existed in the garden. Um, but we blew the doors wide open to it in America by uh, going in a pietistic direction, or as I would define pietism, as we defined in the last show. Um, now the response and the overbalance that we see coming from um, people who are just arriving on the scene and going, wait a minute, uh, since 2020 especially, and, and there are many people who recognized it before who are perhaps becoming a little imbalanced from my perspective, um, They are, but they are just arriving in the last five years um, and saying, you know what, the, the American state has become tyrannical. These secular humanist Marxists are horrible, and we're not going to put up with it anymore. Now it's time to dig in and say, okay, there is more to it than Thomas Aquinas. And not everything Thomas Aquinas said was correct. Um, He had some interesting things to say, but let's take a look at what the Founding Fathers did. They weren't correct either, but it's really interesting to see how they cherry-picked. 
And they did so honestly. They, when, when, they, when they appreciated uh, Thomas Aquinas, they borrowed whole cloth. And when he was wrong, they said, bye, drop it, <laughs> kick it out. It doesn't matter anymore. We're not, we're not going there. When they liked the Puritans, they quoted from, whole, from them whole cloth, John Witherspoon. And when, when the Puritans went too far, Witherspoon didn't have any problem with a constitution which set up uh, a state in which you could worship some other god as long as you did not violate the core mission of that God gives to the state. You can come here and say, I believe in Allah. You can't go on jihad. Okay, that is that is the American perspective, and it always has been. That's what the First Amendment is about. Um, and I would submit that that is the correct place to cut the cake under the New Testament. And that under since Christ has come, it has it is different, and it's taken us a while, honest and from an honest biblical perspective, to recognize that Luther got it wrong, um, Cromwell got it wrong. Um, you can look at Europe and you can look at Christendom in Europe and you can say, yeah, the, what you are describing, and I think what is accurately described as sacralism, is the problem that has to be worked out of the system. So please, let's not go back. We have 250 years almost now of, of it, doing it better, um, of having at least a record of how to do it better. And we forget that the problems in modern America have not existed for that long. It is, it is not that long ago, and it's not to say that cultural Christianity is great, it's not to say there aren't problems, but there are things to be learned and, and, and to benefit from in the American experience that if we pendulum swing too far towards the, the, the popish tyranny and the mm -hmm. popish secularism, <clears throat> um, it, it's not good. We're giving up stuff we shouldn't give up. Right. Right. Well, I'm not going so to think... I'm not, I'm not step on that sermon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate appreciate your comment, and it got my my uh, thoughts going. I think as we close, we want to ask the question. Okay, so biblically, and this is not something you know we necessarily need to dive into, nor do we have time to dive into it right now. But I think it is the question we want to leave people with, and I think it's a question we want to at least take a glancing blow at and give you a chance to to take a whack at. We've talked about it a little bit. So when we say that under the new covenant. Um, a Christian nation is one which has a limited, there, there are limited things from Scripture that are applied through civil government. Civil government must, not only may, but must outlaw murder on the basis that the God of the Bible says it's murder, that the Ten Commandments say it's murder and you don't do it. And we are given a very clear way to deal with it. We are given a clear judicial process, which includes two witnesses, et cetera, et cetera. The entire Western jurisprudence perspective the jurisprudential perspective on murder comes from the Bible, um, and it should. However, the civil government should not, for example, from my perspective, be uh, mandating that you may worship this God and not that God. You may have a house of worship for Yahweh, the God of the Bible. You may not build a mosque. Um, I believe that that is unbiblical, so I'll throw that out. Do you agree? And if so, as much as you want to address now, why? <laughs> Well, so here's a hand grenade. Yeah, no kidding. So it's almost yeah, over. Yeah. This is this is all, this is all the discussion of the first table, second table, uh, as far as what the magistrate is supposed to be able to do. And you know, it, you mentioned that I uh, I think Dennis mentioned he listened to some of the sweater vest dialogues that uh, that Doug Wilson and I have done, and I've been fairly consistent mm -hmm. in talking with him and, and saying, look, it's one thing for us to be thinking about these things right now so that we can prophetically speak to our society. There's so much darkness. We're, we're the light, we're the salt. Um, and we need, we, we, we need to be salty and we need to be bright uh, over against the darkness because there's just so much darkness right now. But from my perspective, I don't see that Isaiah 42, four is being fulfilled right now that uh, Psalm two is being fulfilled right now in the sense of, a massive work of the spirit of God that's bringing, um, you know, the coastlands are not seeking after the Torah of Yahweh right now. Um, and so I think there is a, a appropriate way of, of saying, yes, we need to think these things through. We need to be even disagreeing about these things, learning from one another, but we need to recognize that we're not in the, situation where 
once the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth as the seas cover the uh, waters cover the seas, um, that's still future in my in my understanding of eschatology, and therefore um, we're going to be in a different situation then, and we can't we can't come up with an answer now that we're going to then force mm. there. We need to come up with answers now that uh, are biblical and that are also humble. In other words, mm. uh, th there, there needs to be some things where we go, you know, a lot more work needs to be done on that. And I'm not sure that we've really come to a, a final conclusion. And I'm, I'm not seeing that humility from a lot of folks, unfortunately. And that's, that to me is dangerous. Uh, because it it ends up creating dogma when we're not ready for that dogma to be applied or to be actually understood. And so as to, you know, if 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 80 percent of a nation um, is truly regenerate and they want God's blessing on their land, then could you not make an argument that it would be appropriate for them to not allow idolatry to take place in their land. Now we're in a completely different situation. We're, we're talking, you know, I'm not sure what percentage either you guys would, would say for the United States of actually true regenerate people. Um, it's certainly not the polls that we see, you know, well, 40%. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> well, we could important. just take a credible profession and uh, that, that would be a, that would be a legitimate standard and it ain't 40%. I agree. That's exactly right. And so yeah. uh, I, I think we have to be humble enough to go that I think, I think the answer is going to be somewhat dependent upon how we can make application to where we are in, in God's decree of this world. You know, I, are we, are we in a situation where we're the small minority are we in a situation where the large large majority? I think it's going to end up influencing how we answer that that question, um, and we have to, I think, allow allow for that. Um, that's that's my very politically correct way of answering that one. Well, I appreciate yeah. what you're saying there and the way that you brought it forward because there there's a lot of wisdom there, and you broke some things down that I'm going to think about further, and I appreciate that. I think the one thing I would note is that we live in a society where if we want to solve a problem, the first thing out of our mouths is there ought to be a law. <laughs> and um, the, the tools in the toolbox for combating um, idolatry are much wider than that, much greater than that. When you have a society which is mandated by God to include only people who profess faith in him, and who are, who are born into that community in that way, which is what Old Testament Israel was, then you can have a society in which if you do not live up to a fairly strict um, list of theological checkboxes, Very um, you can be disenfranchised. You, you, don't, you, you may not be executed, which is often what gets thrown up. Oh, well, you're going to execute all the Baptists. Oh, please. Not the, the, not the strictest covenanters today believe that. Uh, they, uh, they did it one time, and there was a lot of political wrangling back and forth, and I will acknowledge that freely. But talk to some of the most strict covenanters you can find today. They'll all say, well, I might not want you to vote if you're a Baptist. Um, but I, and they will say that. Um, I respectfully disagree, even at 80%. And I would, uh, my, my thought, and this is, you know, we're discussing it, uh, and uh, respectfully, from, from my age and position to, to your age and position, I acknowledge um, in a good way, um, the the reality I believe under the new covenant is you you can't you you are not required to covenant and and accept the um, requirements of Old Testament Israel because that is not that is not how nations work under the New Testament uh, since Christ has come. You have uh, people who profess Christ, and if it's eighty percent, great. You don't need a law. <laughs> you are not going to need a law. To, guarantee, to safeguard and guarantee um, that, at least for the time being, uh, proselytes from elsewhere are, are not going to make progress. Um, there is a cultural way to deal with that. And in the same way that under the, old, under the Old Testament law, if you were from a pagan nation, you could be enslaved by Israel. How does that work today? Do we enslave unbelievers? Absolutely not. That's abhorrent. And so what that speaks to is 
the condition for membership in the political franchise in the civil government is different from that in the church. Wasn't wasn't the case, and we all agree it wasn't the case under the old covenant. So there's an interesting uh, stopping point, perhaps. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Dr. White, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate your perspective. You're giving me a lot to think about. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.